I, in my previous life, I was an internist. I took care of hundreds of nursing home patients in six or seven. I even came down here to Green Valley for a while. And I saw what it was like to live from 82 to 92 in a nursing home. And I vowed that I would not let my patients do that, you know. I mean, these four little old ladies were osteoporotic, in pain, demented, incontinent. Uh, it was sad. But you can keep these people alive for a long time with no quality of life. And so it's funny that I joined this place called Quality of Life because that is my battle cry. I don't want to be 110 and spend 20 years in a, in a retirement center or, or a nursing home. I want to live a robust, vital life as far as I can. And when time to go, go quickly and go peacefully. So it's quality of life, not quantity of life. And something called health span, not lifespan. Okay. We know some men here. And men are simple. They are very easy to treat. Women are incredibly complex. Uh, a woman's hormone balance uh, takes a lot of understanding, experience, and patience. But when, when we look at men, there's something called the Adams Questionnaire that we ask them 10 questions. And to be honest, I'm really sick and tired of this latest societal push to get men more sexually active, you know. It's, it's tiresome, it's bothersome. Testosterone has so many other important functions besides raising libido and improving erectile function that I, I put it down the list. And sometimes I even forget to talk about it. The symptom of, the main symptom of low testosterone is decreased energy. Okay? And when I talk about motivational energy, I see guys all the time you know, 10 years younger than me, out of shape, they're tired, they have all the symptoms. And I'll say, uh, well, how many push-ups can you do? And they'll say, I don't know, I haven't done a push-up in 30 years. I say, why not? You know? So it's motivational energy. You know, uh, a guy gets low in testosterone in his 50s or whenever, 40 sometimes, and he says, you know, I should go to the gym. Oh, the hell with it, I just watch sports, you know. Or I should clean the garage, you know. So you, you, you lose energy and you feel tired, but it's this motivational energy to do something about your situation. The next one, of course, is decrease in strength or endurance. Men and women tend to lose lean body mass every decade from 30 on. So from age 30 to age 60, you can lose as much as 24% of your muscle mass and your bone mass. And uh, testosterone is an anabolic steroid. It promotes protein retention. It allows you to build back your muscle mass and your bone mass. And my latest battle cry is your brain mass. Okay. There's something about testosterone that improves uh, neuronal function, brain function, and looks to be uh, preventative in the three kinds of dementia for men and women. This is new information. It's crucial. Because you know, all of us baby boomers are getting older, and you know, you got all this Cialis commercials and, and uh, exercise commercials and you know, all this stuff. But what good is it if you have the most perfect body in the nursing home? So we have to start thinking about keeping our brains as healthy as possible. And thyroid and testosterone are two hormones that your brain needs very, very much to stay healthy. And low-grade thyroid deficiency have to be addressed. I treat women and men with testosterone. Next is, of course, this is where it comes in, a decreased libido erection, less strong. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's sort of funny because um, every guy says the same thing. I say, are your erections less strong? Well, not like when I was 18. I got, you know, it's, it's it, you see, the thing about menopause is it's a very dramatic time in a woman's life. A woman's hormones drop, she gets hot flashes, night sweats, she gets mood swings, irritability, she cannot sleep. She has all these tremendous symptoms, and usually it's the not sleeping that brings them into the doctor because they can, you know, they can radiate heat and all that stuff. With men, we peak our testosterone and our growth hormone at age 19, and it's a slow decline, slow decline. So men get kind of used to no energy, decreased strength and endurance, decreased libido, and it, the thing that kills me is I'll see a 52-year-old guy who's overweight, out of shape. And I'll ask about this, and he'll say, well, what do you want at my age? And I just want to slap him. And, you know, I want a lot at your age. 
But like I say, men just slowly drift into this and they accept it as the aging process. The next one is, this is interesting. Um, <laughs> decrease in joy of life and feeling sad and grumpy. The typical guy with low testosterone is a curmudgeon. He, he's negative. He doesn't even realize he's in this negative world. Um, and testosterone is a mood elevator for women and men. If you're on the right dose, it definitely Im improves your mood. Um, and so these questions uh, you know, point at that part of testosterone. So uh, I'm painting a picture that this emphasis on sex is ridiculous. There are so many important factors for testosterone in men, and growth hormone too. Here's one that you don't think about. Well, I love falling asleep after dinner is my favorite one. Sometimes a guy will come with his wife, and he'll deny all these, and, and, and she'll say, he falls asleep every night at 7.30 on the easy chair watching television. Well, oh, okay, that's interesting. But decreased height. Testosterone and growth hormone are the only two hormones that are anabolic and maintain bone mass. So I get bone densities and body compositions out of all my guys and women. And if a man has significant osteopenia of his backbone, he's been testosterone deficient for years. And Untreated. And, you know, how do you become a little old man? You lose your bone mass, you lose your muscle mass, you lose your brain mass. So the whole key to this preventative approach is to reverse that. Build back the bone mass, build back the muscle mass, and get the brain functioning as much as possible. Uh, one, one is the total testosterone, that's relatively meaningless. And most physicians get one number, total testosterone. But total testosterone doesn't mean anything because the majority of testosterone is bound to protein, bound to these molecules, sex hormone binding globulin, albumin, other protein molecules. It doesn't enter the cell, it doesn't do a thing except circulate and be, and be measured. The only testosterone that matters for women and men is the free testosterone. And the other thing I've talked about is, is the rough and trages. Patients think that God came down from heaven and gave Moses these tablets and said, you will have these ranges, you know. Free testosterone, 35 to 155. If your free testosterone is 35 and you're a guy, you're a girl. <laughs> it's like these ranges were made up a long time ago, and they just took, I don't know, 10,000 guys from all walks of life, all sorts of high testosterone guys, low testosterone guys. They did an average, they did two standard deviations on both sides, that's how they came up with the range. But when you're working with people and you're doing anti-aging, you realize that these ranges have no bearing on where you really want to go. So my personal therapeutic goal for my guys is to get their free testosterone up to around 200. It makes all the difference in the world. And personally, I cannot achieve that with the gels and the compound and stuff. I use weekly injections of testosterone and sipionate, and it works real well. Now, when you're checking guys, sometimes you know doctors that don't really do this much sort of agree to start testosterone, but they don't realize you have to check the metabolites of testosterone. Testosterone is metabolized to DHT, which is another male hormone, and estradiol, female hormone. And the sad fact is, as we get older and fatter and take statins and take other medications, the amount of testosterone that's converted to estradiol goes up. And in this country, the average 58-year-old man has a higher estradiol than the average 58 year old So high estrogen has, is a terrible thing that doctors who don't know this business don't check. So you always want to check the estradiol and it's high, block it with an estrogen blocker. DHT is the one that you have to check when you're using the creams because in our skin is the enzyme that converts the DHT. Now elevated DHT is associated with male pattern baldness and large prostate. I don't go there very much, but I've seen guys on creams that have really elevated type of DHTs. PSA, not great. Okay, for your, your audience have been saying for 50 years that testosterone causes prostate cancer. But let's think about that a second. Let's pay $1,000 to 1,000 19 year old guys at the U of A, okay, and do prostate biopsies and, and uh, testosterone levels. Then let's go to all the nursing homes and, and pay the old guys, nine-year-old guys, a lot do prostate biopsies and testosterone. Okay, the college kids are going to have testosterone levels off the chart, and you're going to see zero prostate cancer. The old guys are going to have 85, 90% prostate cancer cells in their prostate. 
it's, it doesn't mean anything, they're there, and their testosterone is the level of females, very, very low. So intuitively, that's always been wrong. The, who's the good guy? It's the South Koreans, right? Yeah. The South Koreans did a really good study not too long ago where they went around and they prostate biopsied a bunch of guys, I mean more than a thousand, got the cells, then went back and checked their levels. So they had this, the cells first. And it was amazing. There was an inverse correlation between the development of prostate cancer and testosterone levels. That is to say that if you're a 70 year old guy and your testosterone is pretty high, you're not having prostate cancer. If you're a 50 year old guy and your, prostate, and your testosterone is low, you have a higher incidence of prostate cancer. So what I'm saying is testosterone does not cause prostate cancer. However, if your father had prostate cancer, your grandfather, your uncle, your brother, you're, you have a predilection, genetic predilection. So if you're using testosterone therapy, you've got to monitor the PSA on a regular basis. And I do that. So, so that's, that's sort of a side issue. Um, but, you know, no matter how much data comes out, you know, doctors are funny. They learn something in medicine school, and that's what it is. They don't change. They don't have the ability to incorporate new data. It's just very frustrating. So these are the things. Oh, no, we go, ah, women. Ah, women. You know, sometimes... <laughs> I, sometimes I ask, um, I'll ask a woman to go to her primary care physician and draw some labs, and I'll fill out the lab slip, and it'll be total and free testosterone. And the doctor said, oh, you don't need testosterone, you're a woman. And, and that's really was sort of the state of the art for the majority of physicians. Testosterone is extremely important for women, extremely important. Testosterone, as I said, prevents and reverses osteopenia and osteoporosis. And I have seen it, I have cases where a woman had osteopenia of her femoral neck, went on vitamin D, calcium, weightlifting, and, and testosterone, and two years later her bone density is normal. So that's crucial. Again, we talk about becoming a little old lady. I get all my women in the gym. I get them all weightlifting because you have to do resistance with testosterone to rebuild your muscle mass. And when women come to me in their like early 53 typical, they say, you know, I in a brain fog. I think I'm getting Alzheimer's. And what, hof, what often times is the case is they're a little low in thyroid and real low in testosterone. So you put them on these hormones and in about six weeks later they say, well, I'm back to my sharp self again. So we have this clinical experience that testosterone helps brain function and now we have data from a Swedish study that took 20 years to indicate that women over 60 who stay testosterone deficient have a much higher incidence of the three kinds of dementia, multi-infarct, senile, and Alzheimer's. So this is new information and I think extremely, extremely important. In terms of um, uh, libido, testosterone is central to, to the desire to have sex, fantasizing about sex. Nipple and clitoral sensitivity is entirely mediated by testosterone. So a woman who is very low in testosterone really can't have an orgasm, can't enjoy sex, and so why even bother? And you know, a lot of times, and, and Dana's been in the forefront of this, we have um, uh, estrogen and testosterone creams that we use, and we tell the woman to apply the testosterone to the clitoral area three times a week, and um, do we ask them, what about the nipples, and that, that's the stomach. And uh, it's wonderful, because it brings back the sensitivity, and women are Did able to... Did the nipples too? Yes, but no, you know, because you're taking testosterone systemically, and that systemic uh, uh, effect will eventually resensitize your nipples. But the clitoris, is, you know, we really try to get that, you know, up to speed, so to speak. Um, one of the common symptoms of low testosterone women is atrophic vaginitis, or postmenopausal vaginitis, what's some other words? Vaginal dryness. And so women have their mucosa, vaginal mucosa, thins out. So you need estrogen, big time, and you need testosterone a lot of times. So we have this combination, Dana has some really wonderful combination, estrogen, testosterone, and something called hyaluronic acid that restores the mucosa, brings back the lubrication, and all of a sudden sex isn't painful, sex is pleasurable, and it's, to me it's a very, very important quality of life issue. Um, and, and, you know, uh, all this stuff, uh, urinary incontinence, um, relates to um, the, the senile degenerative changes that the vagina and the pelvic organs, organs go through 
uh, when these hormones are lacking. So, we talked about that. Okay, low progesterone. You know, a lot of women, especially early in menopause, present with estrogen dominance. You know, estrogen dominance, so here's what I mean. Their ovaries are still producing buckets of estrogen, but they're making no progesterone and no testosterone. And that is a very, very bad situation. Estrogen dominance is the main cause of breast cancer. Period. My sister got it. Yeah, yeah. And so. Of that. And we, I told her about going and getting bioidentical hormones through a compounding pharmacy, and, and she said my insurance will pay. It. It's a tough battle. So she ended up with breast cancer. It's a tough battle. And so what, what we do is, we, we, what I do is, if a woman's still making adequate amounts of uh, estrogen, she's not having hot flashes, I'll bring her progesterone way up because, I think we have a slide about this, estrogen stimulates the breast receptors 250%. So think about it. If you don't have progesterone to down-regulate that, the, the receptors are being constantly bombarded day and night. And that constant bar bom bombardment of the receptors leads to dysplasia and then cancer. Say that again, about the 250%. Okay, estrogen alone, unopposed, stimulates or upregulates or, um, it's another verb, um, causes the estrogen receptors to over be stimulated. And over time, without the progesterone to downregulate that, uh, you get breast cancer. Progesterone decreases these receptors, the activity or the Simulations are like 400 percent. So I'm absolutely sure. Thanks. I'm absolutely positive that bioidentical natural progesterone protects women from breast cancer and uterine cancer. There's no doubt about it. Now, when are we going to get to the controversy? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Which one causes your hair to fall out when you get older as a woman? The main, the main reason is hypothyroidism, low thyroid, and the second reason is estrogen dominance. Okay. Because you think about it, if you're estrogen dominant, your hair follicles are being bombarded nonstop. And after a while, the follicles say, oh, the hell with it, and they just give up the hair. So what I do with women losing scalp hair is get them on thyroid and get them on a really good dose of progesterone. So, okay, this still comes around to haunt us. If you wanted to make up a study to prove that the synthetic horrible poisonous drugs that doctors have been using, Permanent and Provera, this is the study they did. They took a large group, there's 6,000 women, nurses, older, an incredible number of them were smokers. Now these women had pre-existing disease, okay? You don't get to be in your 60s and smoke and have a poor lifestyle without coronary atherosclerosis, probably early breast lesions, and, and carotid problems. So they put them on Premarin, which is a product that's made for pregnant horses, urine. And there are 20, equivalents, 20, different, or 20 different estrogens in that. One of the compounds is called equivalent. It is a known cancer-causing agent. Premarin should have been taken off the market when this study came out. But why it makes $4 billion a year in profit and you know, that really makes a difference in, in economy and in the FDA and that cozy relationship. Uh, and I'm infuriated. The reason God has me on this earth is to protect women from these synthetic drugs. Provera, medroxyprogesterone acetate, is a horrible drug. It's inflammatory. It's not progesterone. And it, we have a, a slide that shows the, the moleculars and you can see how alien it is. And so, these drugs are inflammatory. They cause breast cancer, they cause heart disease, they cause strokes. And so, okay, now you have a group of women that never had any hormone protection, so they had these degenerative diseases proceeding, put them on these poisons, and what do you know? They had a lot more breast cancer, heart attack strokes, and the study said, we're stopping this study, and the media says, hormones are bad, get off all hormones, okay? So what they don't distinguish is these synthetic hormones are bad. They are terrible. Bioidentical hormones, and that's the one Dana and her staff makes, are compounded from wild yams. They are an exact same molecule 
as what you were making when you were young and your ovaries were producing. And there's this concept of lock and key. So you have a receptor on a cell and you have a hormone. The, the bioidentical hormone fits that receptor perfectly and gets in the cell and does the work of the hormone. The synthetic ones do not do that. They have some effect, but the effect that they have is accompanied by terrible, terrible long-term side effects. I mean, back when I was training in the 70s, it was very, very common and popular. If a woman sneezed and had some dysfunctional uterine bleeding, she was put in the hospital at TMC for two weeks, had a total abdominal hysterectomy, and discharged on prep. Looking back, it was the worst thing you could possibly do. Because if you put a woman on this synthetic fremer, which is, where is it? Where is the damn stuff? Here, back one. There. Um, you are making her estrogen dominant. <laughs> so you're creating a situation where the poor woman had her ovaries and uterus removed. Now you're giving her an inflammatory hormone that has no down regulation from progesterone, and she's a setup for heart attack, cancer, blood, breast cancer, and throat. It's a black era in medicine, you know, just like, you know, you know bloodletting or leeches, or I think more, and it's still going on. So the message is we check these levels and we replace them with bioidentical hormones. Now, you never take a pill. When you take an, an oral hormone, it passes through your liver, and there's something called first pass metabolism. And what that does is it sets up this inflammatory response. Now, inflammation is the base cause of all degenerative illnesses. Cancer, atherosclerosis, arthritis, you name it. And so doctors have sort of been looking on the outside saying, well, you know, I think it's cholesterol, so take these statins. That really causes atherosclerosis. But really, when you look at it and the, and the studies come in, it's really inflammation that causes coronary and, and peripheral atherosclerosis. And interesting, statins have a mild anti-inflammatory effect. So it probably has very little to do with lowering LDL or total cholesterol, but the anti-inflammatory effect. So I, we only use sublingual, which trochees under the tongue, or transdermal forms. I personally prefer the transdermal. I get better results, I get better levels. They're more expensive. Um, so you mean you like the creams versus yes, trochees? Yes, I do. Yes. Trochees, you put another tongue and you just, I mean, my wife still uses trochees. You know, she's cheap. I'm going to say. She's, yeah, they gave me trochees. Yeah, I mean, it, it my works. My husband took trochees and didn't do anything. <laughs> he went on the cream and we saw results. Okay. Yeah. The, the root of administration is important. Some women have a lot of vessels on their tongue. I look. Everyone I see, lift your tongue up, and I see this tremendous plethora of vessels. And that one probably is going to do pretty well with trochees. Sometimes I look and I see like two veins. And I know that trochees are not going to be a good alternative for that patient. So there's different things. Same thing with skin. Some women have thin skin, some women have thick skin, and some women absorb through the skin better. So you sort of have to look at the patient and decide which is the best route of administration. But we never give oral body hormones. Except for progesterone, which we put in a capsule in oil, and as but it's bioidentical progesterone, not this pill. And when Dana formulates bias, she uses 85% estriol, 80% estriol, and 20% estradiol. Estrone is a bad actor. Okay, there are three hormones that women make, so we stay away from estrone. Estradiol is kind of more neutral. I mean, it does have benefits, but it's not as healthy as estriol. And are you going to get into the uh, um, I, I'm going to talk about the estrogens, okay. but just um, just on the 30th last week, um, a study came out in JAMA, which is a very well-respected journal medically, mm -hmm. um, that compared con the Premarin to estradiol orally, which Dr. Mahali said he doesn't like to give it orally, but this study looked at oral use, and it showed that those that were on estradiol um, actually had lower risk of stroke, MIs, and blood clots um, versus the, the Premarin therapy. Right. So. That was just last week that that came out. So, you know, sometimes, you know, if you think about it, we don't have a health care system, we have a sick care system, okay? Oh, I know. And if, if 
the medical system and the insurance companies understood the benefit of prevention, then they would cover bioidentical hormones. You know, one of the analogy is we have a system where people are falling off the cliff and they're hitting the bottom and we have a system we call 911, the ambulance, we rush in the emergency room, we do surgery, we put them on drugs. And so the concept is why don't we build a fence on top of the cliff to prevent them from falling over? And the answer is, well, we're spending all our money down here. And it's a battle cry for me. Sometimes women don't have the money for bioidentical hormone replacement. It could be $70 a month, okay? It doesn't, it's not covered by insurance. And sometimes I have to try and use prescription type estrogens. So I'll use something called Vival Patch, which is an estradiol, it's transdermal, and something called Prometrium, which is an oral progesterone. It's not the best, but it just economically, sometimes I have to go there. I always prefer the, the, the compound transdermal. I was gonna chime in here too. One thing I learned when I was in pharmacy school, and I uh, worked at an HMO for one of my rotations, and the drug companies pay your insurance companies incentives to use their drugs. So when you're talking about using a custom compounded product that's made just for you, we're not incentivizing your drug, your insurance company to pay for that prescription. And everybody's prescription is different. So it has to be processed differently, which is difficult. And a lot of insurance companies, that's just, it's just an ease of, you know, it's too difficult. It's too hard to process. Um, it's not on my formulary. I'm not getting reimbursed by you. But when it comes to like cholesterol drugs, there's like 10 of them on the market. How does your insurance company decide which one to cover? It's all dollars. Which company is giving me the biggest, biggest kickback? Which one is cheapest? It's all dollars. And unfortunately, there's a lot of healthcare decisions that aren't made based on the fact that this is the best drug. It's that this is the cheapest drug and this is the one that's giving me the best kickback. Absolutely right. What are you going to do about the FDA now trying to get into compounding? I'll talk products? about that at the end. Okay. It was in the paper this week. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is why the doctors took the rise of the knuckleheads. Okay, that's me. But, you know, this is what they said in medical school. 30 years ago, they went to medical school in the 60s. They don't keep up with current knowledge. They have no idea what bioidentical hormones are because they had, you know, a typical doctor sees 30 patients a day every seven minutes, blah, blah, blah. He's burned out. He's just trying to get through the day. He's, you know, the insurance companies want them prior offs for everything. They deny half the things and your poor staff is running around trying. So he doesn't really have time to step back and say, well, wait a minute, there's something else out here. You know, I was lucky. I, I had a personal experience and so that I, I, saw, the, I saw the picture, I saw the light, and, and I got away from practicing internal medicine, which I did for 22 years, and I, I, I embraced this preventative wellness approach. So. Um, the, you know, lack of public scientific research. Well, you know, now we have 20-year data on growth hormone, for instance, just to give you a little example. Okay, so when, in the 90s, the snotty internist says, show me your 20-year data. Okay. So now we have 20-year data, and now they're saying, show me your 30-year data. I mean, it's like you want to kill them. Um, so we do have studies uh, on bioidentical hormones, and they're uniformly positive. And they do not show any increase in all these terrible diseases. And they do show benefits. Um, so, but you can't patent it. So Merck or Lilly is not going to spend millions of dollars to, to look at these things when they can't put a patent on it and make trillions of dollars in, uh, in, you know, in benefits. Wait, go back one more time to, okay. Yeah, so it's so all that stuff. Progesterone is a phenomenal hormone. I, it's my favorite. I love progesterone. I want to start taking it, but then I feel I'll probably start crying at movies and looking at purses and stuff. But, you know, progesterone is, it, it helps women sleep. You know, a lot of times women present with insomnia. Yeah, they've had hot flashes, they've had dry vagina, they've had, but when they can't sleep, they come in, and those women are progesterone deficient. Progesterone is a wonderful hormone that calms women and lets them sleep. You know, sort of back when I, I think when I was even uh, growing up as a teenager, uh, my mother went through a period when my father said, she's a witch, you know, we didn't know what it was. Uh, and, and, you know, progesterone calms women down and it helps them sleep. I never see a woman with too much progesterone. Never. Never. Just doesn't happen. 
See, I thought I was taking too much. It doesn't but happen. now I'm not afraid. It doesn't happen. It's a wonderful one. Very safe. Um, it, it has a mild effect on uh, osteoclastic so it mildly helps to build new bone. Not like growth hormone testosterone. Um, but the mood, the sleep, the anxiety is fantastic. And it definitely prevents breast cancer and uterine cancer. No doubt about it. And you know, that's that's a bold statement, but um, I just, you know, we have the ability to prevent these horrible diseases for women. Why aren't we taking advantage of it? You know, it's, it's in the range of about 30 to 60, in that range. Um, it does raise good cholesterol. I mean, estrogen protects women from coronary disease. When a woman goes through menopause and her estrogen is gone, she develops the same incidence of heart attacks as men. And that's the proof that estrogen does that. So estrogen has a phenomenal effect on keeping your coronaries clean. Um, what I've learned, and Dana has been pivotal in this, is if a woman has pain on intercourse, bleeding at the intercourse, dry vagina, itch, you know, urinary incontinence, rather than give them tons of estrogen systemically, I treat locally with these wonderful new compounds that you can in, you know, use intravaginally. And it's wonderful. So you don't have to make a woman estrogen dominant to treat vagina, which needs more estrogen than all the rest of your body put together. So, you know, and again, estriol, estriol is the best. Estradiol is second, and we want to stay away from estrogen. So, yeah, hair, skin, and nails. That's, you know, women like hair, skin, and nails. That's estrogen. Uh, you know, when I tell a woman I'm going to put her on testosterone, I can just see her face. She thinks she's going to have to shave, she's going to grow a penis, she's going to have to fights in bars, you know, and, and I say, you know, it's, it's not like that. If we went, if we had a time machine, we took any one of you women back, and we went back to the flower of your youth, when were you the most feminine? 22 or something. And we drew your blood, and we got a free testosterone, it would be 10, 12, something like that, and your total testosterone would be 120. So, and you weren't shaving, you didn't have all these male characteristics, that's what a healthy young woman has. So, I, I keep the, the free testosterone in, for, it depends, you know, some women are high testosterone, some women are low testosterone, so you have to keep back that in. But if a woman's, you know, high testosterone woman, I keep her free testosterone between 6 and 10, somewhere in that range. And, like I say, the only problem with, with testosterone, which is, we know there's got to be something wrong, is if, if I get a woman too much, she'll start getting, it increases the oil production of our receiving glands, she'll start getting facial acne. But that's an easy thing to correct. That's the biggest problem, you know, with testosterone. If you overdose on it, you start getting facial acne, and you have to go to the pharmacy and buy Clarisil, and you feel kind of funny. So, you know, but that's an easy thing to, to overcome. Uh, but this is where Dane's going to take over right here, because this is important. Can I just ask you what DHEA does to your it, testosterone? DHEA is, is, is a crappy supplement. Yeah, I know. I got in trouble with it. Yeah. It, it is a precursor molecule, like pregnenolone. And so the theory is DHEA, you take DHEA, and it fi finds its way down to make testosterone. However, it can make aldosterone, which is a kidney hormone. It can make other things. You have no control where DHEA is going to go. But the big problem I found with DHEA is it stimulates the heck out of this molecule called sex hormone binding globulin, which is a big pain in my rear end. Because this molecule, sex hormone binding, binds your hormone and doesn't let any get into the cell. And it make, it's a nightmare. So a woman's been on 200 milligrams of DHEA, her sex hormone binding globulin is 240. And it's a mess to try and bring that down. It takes years. So personally, I'm an anti-DHEA guy because you know we're taking the end products. We don't need the we don't need the precursors. We're taking estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. We don't need to mess with DHEA. There's a handout on your making sure you're using iodized salt is important. Um, these are some of the symptoms of hypothyroidism, and I kind of mentioned those earlier as well. And again, I want to emphasize. I'm telling you right now, if you are in your 50s, 60s, or 70s, and you're hypothyroid you are going to become demented. I'm telling you right now mm -hmm. that the thyroid hormone has a lot to do with maintaining neurons, okay? As does testosterone. And it is amazing to me how I have women and men sometimes come in and they are 
convinced they have Alzheimer's. And you get them right, you know, balanced all the way across the, you know, through their diet, their exercise, everything, because, you know, the brain needs circulation too. And they come back. They come back and they're amazing. No, it is amazing. They can come back. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I'm very aggressive at monitoring and keeping my patients at optimal levels. I mean, here's the thing. Another thing, Snorquist. The range of the reference range for free T3 is 2.0 to 4.5. If you're 2.0, you're in trouble. Anybody in the twos is hypothyroid clinically. So again, doctors, if they are, if you twist their arm, make them get a free T3, and it's 2.2, they say, well, you're normal. It, it's very frustrating. You have to understand that there are levels that, that give us guidelines, but then if you work with people and you understand what the optimal level is, that's what you want to achieve. Yeah. Do you put cream on for that too? No, that no, thing? that's, uh, you know, Dana can compound T3 and T4. I do use a lot of armor thyroid. I use a lot of Cytomel or pure T3 too. <clears throat> you know, whatever the patient needs to get that perfect balance. But the insurance company wants you to take Synthroid. <laughs> I told them I will not There's take nothing that. wrong with Synthroid. It, it, T4 and T3 are what your body needs. We can compound custom co combinations of them. The problem with Synthroid is that if your body does not make that conversion, Synthroid is T4. If you do not convert T4 to T3, it's not solving the entire problem. And so he was mentioning Cytomel, that's the T3. Yeah. I had seizures. Yeah. I was in the hospital for eight years on and off with seizures. Okay, and yeah. from the level five rocks. Believe me, it's, uh, it's a big issue. Yeah. How do you get a doctor to order a T3 if they'll say, you don't have any symptoms for me to order that T3? Tell them you'll sue him if you don't get a free T3. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them you'll sue them if you don't get a free T3 in your first Because they'll say, well, I can't already do what I heard on. Never see it. I haven't. You know, that's that's in the realm of endocrinology. Hashimoto's thyroiditis and thyroid toxicosis is rare. Women have ten times the incidence of hypothyroidism than men, just because of the interaction between your female hormones and the conversion of T4 to T3. I mean, hyperthyroidism is a condition that you see, but You'll see a hundred hypothyroid patients and one hyperthyroid know, patient. And they all go to endocrinologists and they all have their ways of treating them. I don't touch hyperthyroidism. I try not to cause it by giving too much thyroid. <laughs> I'm sure my mother's dementia was caused from never being put on thyroid medicine. That happens. She was sure. never tested. Yes, young man. When they normally test for testosterone, do they test for both the free no, and the total? No, they do not. They, don't. they used to. They test for the total testosterone, and again, it's 250 to 1100. Okay, so I've seen a fairly young guy, 50 year old guy. He went to his young, pretty female internist. She got a total. It was 252. She said, "Yeah, you're normal." Yeah, you're normal if you're 92 years old. Uh, and so, <clears throat> it's frustrating that doctors don't know to get free t testosterone, free T3, because that's where the money is. That's the only thing that matters. And so you just have to say, look. I, I need to see what my free testosterone is. Do you use a regular medical lab for your testing, or do you do it in your own lab? Uh, I, I prefer some Snorquest lab. They, they do a real good uh, assay. Of, uh, right here in Green Valley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Snorquest. Yeah. So these are the hormones that we just. Um, the gel doesn't isn't messy. It doesn't leak. It is inserted and it's absorbed and it gives you benefit. So most women, if they're using vaginal estrogen, the typical protocol is to use it every night for two weeks and then you use it anywhere between one to three times a week. We will combine it a lot of times with testosterone and hyaluronic acid, um, which is also helpful um, if you're having problems with libido or ability to climax blood flow, um, it's really helpful. The other ways to give estrogen systemically is you can also do it in a topical cream. You rub it on in your inner forearms, inner thighs. It goes into your your bloodstream. You also put it on the upper part of the muscular area of your shoulder. Um, I don't usually recommend applying estrogen to the breast area. Um, and then uh, the trochee form, like you said, a lot of people, it's a very convenient way um, to administer hormones. They don't want to rub it on their skin. You just pop it under your tongue. It dissolves sublingually, avoiding the stomach. Um, and like you said, you know, one dosage form might be right for you and not right for someone else, and that's why there is, you know, different options. 
Um, but we usually, with estrogen, do try to avoid the oral route. Um, there are vaginal suppositories um, that, we, that we compound. And then he mentioned the pellets. I'm not a big fan of pellets. Um, like he said, if it's not the right dose, it's in there and it's gonna stay until it's you know, worn off. And I've, I've seen a lot of people um, that have had side effects that the dose is not right. The other thing that I don't like from the pellet, I see a lot of pellet train wrecks where you've been on it for a long time and the pellet gives you a very high level of, of therapy in the very beginning when it's inserted. And so people that have been on pellets get used to really high doses. So then when they come off of them and they try to go on another therapy, they usually require much higher doses to feel well um, versus someone who had never been on them before. And I'm not a big fan of really high doses. Um, testosterone, same way, you can either do it locally by vaginal insertion um, or you can also do it topically, applied um, you know, in the same areas, um, the inner forearm, inner thighs, back of the shoulder arm area. Um, and you can also do testosterone sublingually. Um, and then they also do it in a pellet form as well. Um, as far as progesterone, um, there is progesterone creams available over the counter without a prescription. I caution you about those. Um, there's usually a lot of other ingredients in them. Um, Wild yam is one of the things that you'll find in it. Although progesterone is derived from wild yam, your body can't take yam and turn it into progesterone. That has to be done in a lab. Um, and there's a lot of side effects of wild yam um, if you take it as well. Um, the other thing is the strongest you can get over the counter is about 17 or 18 milligrams per quarter teaspoon. So in order to get the dose that Dr. Mahali wants to prescribe, you have to like lather your whole body with it and it's still not gonna be enough and it's not gonna be cheaper. So um, it's much, much cheaper actually to get a prescription for progesterone cream. Um, and if you have, had a have not had a hysterectomy, you always have to take progesterone with estrogen. Um, it helps protect your uterus. But just because you've had a hysterectomy and your doctor has told you, oh, you don't need progesterone, does not mean that, that you may not still have benefits from it, which he mentioned before. Um, there's lots of... Um, other ways you can take progesterone. Um, commercially, it's available as a capsule called Prometrium. Um, it's actually formulated in peanut oil. So if you're allergic to peanuts, you can't take it. Um, and actually, there's a study out of Canada showing it's only about 20, 10 to 20% orally absorbed. And I've seen time and time again, people come in on 100 milligrams of, of Prometrium, and we switch them to 100 milligrams in a cream or a troche, and they get so much better blood levels and they feel so much better um, because it's absorbing better. Just progesterone does not absorb well orally. Um, and that's well documented in the literature. Um, trochies are a really good um, way to get the blood level up of, of, of progesterone and so is topical. Um, it's used um, vaginally in pregnancy um, for women trying to achieve a pregnancy and also to help prevent miscarriage. Um, it's also used for PMS. So how do you find out, you know, and there's, there's lots of ways to test hormones. Um, Dr. Mahali and I are big fans of blood tests, although you read in lay literature that, that saliva tests are really good, and those are an option. Your insurance company are not gonna cover it, um, but they definitely are an option, but they're not as well accepted in the medical community, so your doctors may poo-poo it. Um, but there's, you know, there's, there's you know, benefits with both types of tests, but bottom line is we don't live and die by tests. They're a picture in time, they're a piece of the puzzle, your symptoms and how you feel are, are very, very important. So if you know how to properly read a blood test, it can be helpful in your decision. Um, yeah, and the thing about that is, if a doctor doesn't know what the hell to do with the blood test, he's not gonna order it. I mean, they don't have any experience in knowing what the range is, often ranges are for estrogen for testosterone. And so, why confuse themselves? They just refuse to get the test. That's it. And I, there's a slide coming up with the labs, but as far as quality of life, I mean, ultimately, you know, people will say, well, why do I even need to take hormones? Well, what is your quality of life? And how long do I need to take them? Well, again, what is your quality of life? What are your goals? A lot of people, I actually encourage them to go off of their hormones so they realize how bad they feel. Because <laughs> um, they'll say, how do I know that I'm running the right dose? Well, you know what? Cut your dose in half and see how you feel. If none of the symptoms come back, well, let's cut it in half again. And as soon as you start feeling bad, then that's when you have that discussion with your doctor or yourself and say, hey, you know, do you want me to stay on this long term, and is this a better dose for me? But ultimately, it comes down to quality of life and, and what your goals are. 
And that's going to help your decision. If you realize when you cut your dose in half how bad you feel, that's going to give you more motivation to know that you want to take it every day. Yeah, or that your money me, is being well spent by, you know, making this investment. When a woman asks me, when should I stop taking my hormones, I say, when, when, you when do you want to become a little old lady? <laughs> that's usually what I say, when do you want to become a little old lady? You get osteoporosis and miserable to mess and, and become demented. Um, then stop it then. But if you don't, stay on them. My problem with being off hormones is depression. Uh -huh. The depression was so bad I was yes, suicidal. Yes, I see that a lot. I mean suicidal. Definitely see that a lot. And the minute I get back, I, I think I need mine up, but I'm, I had a test. But the problem with getting in is, I called in July and they said, we'll see you after things. Oh, we got to fix that show. And one of the most difficult populations office. are like breast cancer survivors. It's like they feel miserable off hormones. Um, most people would never, ever give these people hormones again. Um, but there are bioidentical hormones besides estrogen that may help with some of that quality of life. But a lot of doctors aren't willing to go there. Um, but a lot of breast cancer survivors will tell you, I would rather live five years feeling good than ten years feeling awful. And it's just really, it matters on your goals. But there are different um, approaches that you can do if someone has had, um, had breast cancer. There are hormones you can use besides estrogen. Um, this is some of the things that are going to happen if you don't take hormones or if you go off of hormones. Um, many, many couples are, be are, are sexually active into their 70s, 80s, 90s these days. And what um, is one of the first things that women notice if they go off hormones is um, urinary incontinence and the vaginal dryness. And estrogen is what's really important for maintaining your, your pelvic health. Um, the bone density. The years that you go through menopause are the years you lose the most bone in your life. So it's that loss of estrogen that you see correspond with the loss of bone mass in your body. So um, keeping estrogen in your system is actually really good for your bones. And that's very well documented in the literature. Circulatory changes, we see a lot of these changes as well as our estrogen declines. Uh, some, some of the um, hormone doctors are saying, well, listen, the reason you're having incontinence and cystocele and stuff like that is because the pelvic musculature, the sling, is weak. And so they're applying testosterone in the perineum thinking that the, the pelvic muscles will become stronger and uh, hold the bladder up and so take a lot of that away. I mean, that, that's uh, an interesting concept. Uh, have you had anybody come in with that sort of... You mean inserting it or putting it on topically? Put it, putting it on topically. Topically? In the perineum, you know, yeah. sort of between the yeah. anus and vagina. I just thought, thought well. That's... You know, I know that when you give estrogen vaginally, it a lot of times will help with urinary incontinence in women. As far as someone who's had, you know, three vaginal deliveries and, you know, they've got sagging and of their uterus and sitting on the, you know, the bladder, that's a, that's a huge issue. And Kegel exercises can be extremely helpful and a lot of women don't understand how to do them properly. We actually in, in Tucson have some wonderful pelvic floor physical therapists probably you never even knew they existed, but they specialize in the pelvic floor in women. And they can be extremely helpful um, with incontinence issues um, in women trying to avoid surgery and, and work with incontinence. Um, they can help with pelvic pain issues. Um, we have some wonderful resources. The goal is to see your levels at. Um, and so that's just something to think about when the doctor tells you you're normal, just because you're in that normal range doesn't mean that that's your optimal level. That's right. Um, as far as other tests that are important to be done, your bone mineral density test is, you know, absolutely important and I recommend getting it as soon as your insurance pays for it. Um, most of insurances don't pay for it till you're 50 um, and then getting it checked either every one or two years depending on, you know, your, your status. Mammograms, I, I still recommend anybody that's taking hormone replacement therapy to get them yearly. I know that some of the organizations are telling you you don't need them every year, but I'm sorry, I still recommend getting them that's yearly. Um, pap smears, I know the recommendations on that have changed as well, um, but if you have a uterus, I, are you still recommending yearly Absolutely. if you're on hormones? Same with PSA in men. I don't care what the, the powers of B say. If you're on testosterone, you're going to have your PSA checked every 26 months with my patient. Tough beans. So pay 99 bucks. Yeah. Fasting insulin, someone asked about that earlier. It's extremely important to check. Um, 
if you're in, you know, he's said that, you know, inflammation is the cause of all disease, and we're also finding that if you have high insulin, that that's also related to a lot of diseases as well. So we're, our focus is really to get people's insulin down as low as we and can. And again, the reference range for that is really, the, the, the reference range goes up to 25. You know, the ideal insulin is less than 5. If your insulin's high, your body will store fat, it will not burn it, and it leads to something called the metabolic syndrome, which is just a straight downhill climb to death. So insulin is a hormone that doctors need to look at and watch and try to bring down to the lowest level possible. Um, lastly, your hemoglobin A1C, that's a reflection of your blood glucose after, over the last three months. Um, so we definitely look at that, especially if you're pre-diabetic. Um, IGF-1, do you want to explain that? I do. Yeah, what is it? Okay. <laughs> Growth hormone therapy is, is the most exciting therapy there is in anti-aging medicine. Growth hormone is anabolic, it's, it's lipolytic, burns fat. It, it increases the dermal layer of your skin. It helps, it strengthens your heart contraction. It increases the sensibility of your aorta. I can go, oh, it's an hour lecture, okay. So IGF-1, we can't really measure growth hormone because we don't have the technical expertise. But IGF-1 is a measure of what your growth hormone level is doing. And so there are certain patients I see that have a cluster of symptoms um, that make me suspicious that they're low in growth hormone. I get IGF-1 and it's 70 or low like that, then they're catered for growth hormone therapy. Big problem. The companies that produce growth hormone have had patents for 14 years. They're going to be uh, over next year, 2014. Right now, one month of growth hormone cost $850. And the insurance is a big one. But in the future, when generic growth hormone is going to be available, it is going to be a, and I, you know, I'm 66, so my generation is going to reap the benefits of growth hormone therapy. The patients that I've had on growth hormone have had startling responses. I mean, startling. Uh, I, a woman that I, I've been seeing for a long time, she's been on growth hormone for seven years. I keep accusing her of having Botox or laser or something because she looks younger and younger. And she also wants to train her body's really good, her bone density is increased. And what it is is that you know, as we age, we lose the dermal, you know, the dermal layer, you know. If you look at a little old lady in nursing home, she's got transparent skin. When you look at a young woman, she's got plump dermal skin. So growth hormone over a period of years reanimates or brings back that living dermal layer. And so when that happens in the face, all those little fine wrinkles go away. And so if you look at somebody like Suzanne Summers or Sylvester Stallone, they're so pumped up in growth hormone because their face is like, Puffing, yeah. you know, and that's, I just saw her. And yeah. her lips, yeah, well, was, they, you know, they use all those things. But growth hormone has so many other benefits. It's amazing. And the patients that I have worked with have had astounding, astounding results. And it's safe. You know, if you're, you, see, the problem is growth hormone has been abused by bodybuilders and professional athletes, and they use massive doses, and all hell breaks loose. So the DEA is demonizing growth hormone, and the AMA is kind of, you know, staying back, but the data is there, and, and if you have adult growth hormone deficiency and you can afford it, believe me, there's nothing like it in anti-aging medicine. All these hormones play a role. The growth hormone, I would say, is the most important anti-aging hormone therapy there is. So, right now, so you think it'll come down? Hmm? You think it'll come down? I do. I think we'll have generic growth hormone starting next year. One interesting thing that I see a lot from a pharmacy standpoint that saddens me is that you'll see doctors prescribing things for them and their wives, but they're not doing it for their patients. <laughs> and they're the ones that are taking the growth hormone, but they're not prescribing it for their patients. That is which so true. It's, it's interesting. And they're the ones that are prescribing the bioidentical hormones for their patients. I mean, for their wives, but not for their patients. And, you know, I think it's because it's, um, it's a lot more work. It's a lot more conversation. And um, a lot of doctors don't have the time. Like you mentioned, you have five to seven minutes. And with Obamacare, it's more like three minutes now. So um, it's, our healthcare system is very broken. Um, we talked about vitamin D and the importance. Um, Definitely, I agree, the levels you want to be between 60 and 80. Um, 
So we talked about labs a lot. We talked about um, if you're taking hormones, you do not have to t stop taking them when you get your levels. Even if you're on synthetic hormones and you're wanting to switch over, we want to know how you're doing on your current therapy and what it's doing to your, your levels. Um, if you're still having periods, um, you definitely, um, there is a, a better time of the month to get your levels. Um, but if you're not having periods anymore, then it doesn't matter. We talked about how long you can take hormones, and it's really an individual decision between you and your provider, and like you said, when you, when you want to become an old lady. Um, how do you talk to your doctor? You know, if you come see someone like Dr. Mahali, it's really easy, but unfortunately, a lot of your providers out there are, you know, uneducated, unwilling to go there, not wanting to have the conversation. And it's interesting, I, I take pharmacy school interns in, the, in my pharmacy, and they come in on rotation every six weeks, and um, one of my current students, um, a gentleman, um, on his first week, and he was, we had a patient, and she, her doctor wouldn't um, prescribe the therapy for her. And I said, well, you know, let's, let's send it to her OBGYN. Um, OBGYN, you know, approved it. And he's like, well, you know, why did you, why did you go against that first doctor's opinion? And I said, well, if you get 10 doctors in a room, I guarantee you're going to have 10 different opinions. And just because that doctor has that opinion doesn't mean he's right or wrong. And when it comes to you and your doctors, even your family practice and your GYN and your specialist, they a lot of times do not agree on what your therapy is going to be or what, you know, you may have a thought of what you want. And it's really how you decide what is best for you. You read, you talk to people, and you find what you're most comfortable with, your answer, because y you can't listen to, to 20 people. It's going gonna, it's gonna to confuse you. You have to find what you can live with and what you feel most comfortable with. Um, there is a lot of literature out there, but unfortunately when it comes to alternative medicine and preventive medicine, we don't have the amount of research that we really need. Um, and so if your doctor says no, and it's something you really believe in, and you want, go to a doctor that you feel more comfortable with working in that has a similar philosophy and, and you know, can be a partner in your health. You want a partner um, for your health care provider. You don't want someone that you're constantly fighting with and disagreeing with. You want someone that really has the same philosophy as you and can be a partner in your care. And there are some nurse practitioners that are very excellent and very knowledgeable. Um, and their nurse practitioners, uh, I think, are very, very good alternative to yeah. uh, physicians. That and we can also help you work with your provider. You know, we may be able to make recommendations to your provider. We do consultations and, and do that. But still, some people, you know, don't want to go there. And sometimes it takes, you know, going to a specialist or someone like Dr. Mahali that specializes in this type of